A hunter, not very bold, was searching for the tracks of a lion. He came upon a man chopping wood in a forest and asked the man if he had seen any marks of the lion's footsteps or if he knew where his lair was. Encouraged by the hunter's question, the man said, I'll show you the lion himself. The hunter turned pale and began chattering his teeth from fear. No, thank you. I wasn't asking for that. It's his tracks only I'm looking for, not the lion himself. The moral of this fable from our friend Aesop is this. The hero is brave in deeds as well as in words. Welcome to The Playbook. I'm your host and coach, Tim Horechko. Tell me if you've ever been in this situation. You have a young patient who maybe is in pain or will receive a painful procedure, and it looks like it'll all work out. Until it doesn't. The child suffers, the parent suffers, and everyone in the room feels awful. Assessing and treating pain in children can involve a lot of hesitancy and uncertainty. We're always trying to be safe, but safe for whom? Undertreatment is easy and sometimes even encouraged, whether outright or just wired into the habits of an institution. Today we'll talk about how to assess children's pain, why it's so important, and what modalities and options we have to relieve suffering in our vulnerable patients. Here's part of the difficulty. Pain is multifactorial. It has all kinds of inputs, physical, psychological, emotional, cultural, and contextual. In children, the predominant input or factor may not be obvious in the beginning. We're trained to focus on the physiologic or anatomic basis of disease, so it's just natural for us to have horse blinders on and deal mostly with the physical component of pain. But here's a tip that I think will save everyone a lot of time and energy and suffering. Use the holistic approach when assessing and treating children's pain. What's the age and developmental stage of the child? How is the child reacting to the condition? What are the circumstances and what is the family or caregiver dynamic? Speaking of the family, this is yet another layer of complexity. Children, even from a very young age, absorb their family's culture and even their family's specific personality. Find out what the context of the visit is. What was going on leading up to the ED visit? This can help us understand better the mechanism of injury if it was a trauma or, for example, the reason the parent is so worried about, say, appendicitis is because an older child had the same thing. Knowing the context, you're better able to interpret what you find. For example, a very anxious caregiver can easily transmit his or her anxiety to the child. That tension or anxiety can either inhibit the child's expression of his pain or really amplify his symptoms. Throughout our discussion today, I'd like us to think about three guiding principles in pediatric pain assessment and management. Know the child, know the family, and know the physiology. Children have long suffered from an under-treatment of their pain because we don't completely acknowledge their pain or because we're afraid to treat it. As the pendulum on pain management swings one way or the other, don't let your pediatric patient get knocked by the wayside. Take a thoughtful approach, know the signs and symptoms, and aggressively treat and reassess. Let's talk about assessment of children's pain. 
Each stage of development offers us a framework to the child's signs and symptoms of their pain. In pre-verbal children, use your observational skills. That from the door initial snapshot is really valuable here. Listen to the parent's report of the behavior and whether or not that interferes with daily routines of feeding, of changing, of bathing, or of sleeping. Verbal children can self-report. Younger children may need some picture aid to describe their pain, while older children and adolescents may use the standard adult scales. In all ages, ask open-ended questions and allow the child to report and speak for himself whenever possible. Neonates. Neonates are a unique group in pain assessment. The neonate is a child from birth to one month of age. He hasn't acquired any social expression of pain and his newly born nervous system is just now learning how to process it. Don't expect typical pain behaviors in neonates. We think of things like facial grimacing, but Liebelt in 2000 notes that the facial grimace is actually a weak indicator of pain in neonates. They may or may not show it, but the heart rate goes up and you may find other, more subtle findings. Look for a furrowed brow. Are his eyes squeezed shut? Is his mouth open vertically, almost as if he wants to cry but makes no sound? Be observant. And of course, always watch for tachycardia, tachypnea, and any change in behavior. There are neonatal observational scales that have been validated in the intensive care unit or in post-op settings, but ED-specific quantitative scales are sadly lacking. One widely used scale for neonates is the CRIES scale. It's based on 10 points using a physiologic basis similar to the APGAR. So CRIES stands for C, crying, R, requires increased oxygen administration, so in distress or breath holding, I, increased vital signs, E, expression, and S, sleeplessness. You can use the scale for documentation, but truthfully for me, I just remember the components of the scale and try to pay attention to catch them if they're there. It helps to know that neonatal pain pathways are very plastic. The neonate is laying down pain pathways that are learned, sometimes right in front of you in the ED, and often because of things we do to them. If we pay attention and treat promptly, we can help to mitigate long-lived pain sensitivity and hyperalgesia. In other words, treat the neonate's pain seriously, as you may save him long-term pain sequelae in the future. Infants and Toddlers This group will begin to exhibit more reproducible, reliable signs and symptoms of pain. For infants less than one year of age, there's the Neonatal Infant Pain Scale, which uses observational and physiologic parameters to detect pain. For children greater than one year who are still preverbal, a well-performing scale is the FLAC score, face, legs, activity, cry, and consolability. This is the one that you'll likely see floating around your ED. Remember, in the infant and toddler group, context matters and the caregiver matters. This is the age where if the child falls and bumps his knee and you say, yay, it will distract him. But the overconcerned, oh no, will set him crying. Conversely, a very stoic family may just have a very stoic toddler. They do exist. Be sure that his fearfulness of you is not a mask for his real pain. Frequent reassessments are helpful as the initial trepidation and fright and triage may not accurately reflect the child's overall pain status. Preschool and school age children. Increasing language development offers us more hope in getting some information directly from the patient. But 
be careful not to ask leading questions. Try to resist the temptation from jumping right to, does this hurt? Preschoolers will say yes to anything. They're trying to please you. Like anyone, they just want to be loved. School-age children may passively affirm you. Does this hurt? Uh-huh. Without much thought. Don't give them something that they see as your statement. They, too, need to validate their human need for care or attention. Start with some ice-breaking banter. Lay down the foundations for rapport and then ask them open-ended questions. Be careful not to let the caregiver instruct the child to tell you where it hurts and how much and how often. Better, try to engage the parents by asking them what behavior they've noticed. Eliciting history from both the child and the parent will go a long way in constructing a richer picture of the etiology and the severity of the pain, and it will help you to build up some rapport and trust. In older children, you'll see the use of the Baker Wong Faces pain rating scale. This is the one with the round cartoon faces from super happy to super crying. Interestingly, this scale was developed with feedback from children. Adolescence. Adolescents can vary in their development, their maturity, and their coping mechanisms. When he or she is stressed, you may see a mixture of childhood and adult behaviors in the same patient. For example, he may be initially stoic and evade all questioning, but then later exhibits a type of pseudo-inconsolability or just can't evenness. Do what you can to see the visit from the adolescent's perspective. Actively transmit your concern and your intention to help. Many adolescents will respond to your efforts to help. They do best when we have a warm, open, non-judgmental, and helpful attitude. The overly tough adolescent is likely secretly fearful. The dramatic adolescent may simply be very anxious. Take a moment to gauge the background behind the presentation. For adolescents, you can use your typical adult scale or the faces pain scale revised, which is the one with the more realistic looking faces than the cartoon ones in Wong Baker. Pain Physiology All right, we're feeling pretty good about detecting and assessing children's pain. To treat it, though, we have to know a little bit about what pain is, how it happens, and what we can do to modify pain pathways. You wouldn't put a laryngoscope into someone's gullet without knowing the anatomy and physiology of the airway, would you? Well, if pain management is the procedure, let's do a quick timeout to think about pain physiology. Pain includes two major components, generation and perception. Generation of pain involves the actual propagation of painful stimuli, either as nociceptive pain, so pain from detecting tissue damage, or from neuropathic pain, a misfired signal because of problems with the nerve itself. Nociceptive pain follows a specific sequence. Transduction, transmission, perception, and modulation. Transduction is an action potential triggered by chemical mediators in the tissue, so that's with your prostaglandins, histamine, bradykinin, and substance P. Transmission is the movement of the action potential signal along the nerve fibers to the spinal cord. Perception is the impulse that travels up the spinal thalamic tract to the thalamus and the midbrain, where input is splayed out to the limbic system, the somatosensory cortex, and the parietal and frontal lobes. And finally, modulation is where the midbrain enlists endorphins, enkephalins, dynorphin, and serotonin to mitigate the pain. So, why am I telling you all this? Because as clinicians, 
we can target specific stations along the pain route to treat the pain more effectively. Well, what does this mean for us in the ED? Simple actions like ice, elevation, local anesthetics, or splinting help in pain transduction. Want to target transmission? Well, we can use various oral, intranasal, or IV analgesics to curb the pain's transmission. Non-pharmacologic techniques like distraction, reframing, and others can help us with pain perception. And it's the sum of these efforts that encourage pain modulation. Now, of course, all of this applies to the typical run-of-the-mill nociceptive pain. A separate phenomenon, of course, is neuropathic pain, the abnormal processing of painful stimuli. It's a dysregulated, chaotic process that's difficult to manage in any setting. Separating nociceptive from neuropathic symptoms may help to select specific pain treatments and to clarify treatment goals and expectations. Neonates. Neonates are exquisitely sensitive to many analgesics. Hepatic enzymes are immature and neonates will have a decreased clearance of the drug, so they will have prolonged circulating levels of whatever you give them. Once you have the pain under control, neonates specifically will need less frequent administration of medications with more frequent reassessments. The neonate's vital organs, so his brain, his heart, his viscera, they make up a larger proportion of his body mass than, say, his muscle or his fat does. That's to say, the volume of distribution is unique in a neonate. Morphine is water-soluble. It will reach these highly perfused vital organs quickly. Just a little too much morphine goes straight to the brain and straight to the heart, with rapid and exaggerated central nervous system and cardiac effects. Fentanyl is a lipid-soluble drug. The neonate doesn't have large fat stores, and he has not so much muscle mass. This explains his low volume of distribution of lipophilic medications. So, lipophilic meds like fentanyl or meperidine don't distribute well in the neonate's body mass and that makes them much more available to the central nervous system, and therefore more potent. So, these are two different ways that two common opioids can hurt a neonate. Other factors that predispose neonates to accidental analgesic overdose are their decreased concentrations of albumin and other plasma proteins. If there's no albumin or plasma protein available in the circulating blood, there's going to be a higher proportion of unbound drug. Again, making analgesics more potent in the less than one month crowd. Renal clearance is also decreased in the first few months of life. Luckily, neonates often need analgesia for procedures rather than for injury. So, we can use non-pharmacologic techniques that engage their sense of touch. So, swaddling, skin-to-skin -skin contact, stroking their little brow and nasal bridge. More about that in a moment. Again, since most neonates we see in the ED need analgesia for procedures, and thankfully not for some traumatic presentation, we can focus on blocking the transmission of pain. We can liberally use Local anesthetics, like eutectic mixture of local anesthetics, EMLA for intact skin, for your IV access, for your lumbar puncture. Or we can also use lidocaine, epinephrine, tetracaine gel, LET or LAT, for superficial open skin and soft tissue applications. Well, what else can we do for them? Take a very common procedure, like lumbar puncture. We can use oral sucrose. It's a 30% solution that's administered either with a small volume syringe or a pacifier frequently dipped in the solution. Harrison et al. and Stevens et al. 
found sucrose solution to be effective for minor procedures through release of dopamine, as well as through distraction by mechanical means. Just sucking on the pacifier repeatedly is soothing to the neonate as well. For the unfortunate neonate with trauma or post-op acute pain, we can manage this pain with parenteral analgesics, but we do so carefully, in a titrated way, on a monitor, with frequent reassessments. Infants and Toddlers They have increasing body mass. They're more like the chunky monkeys with more fat stores, making lipophilic medications like fentanyl safer. Infants and toddlers have another plus or minus, depending on how you look at it. Their metabolism is ramped up. They chew through the analgesics like their candy. So for infants and toddlers, analgesics are safer, but that comes with the risk of undertreatment. For many medications, infants and toddlers will have a greater weight-normalized clearance than adults. In plain English, this means that they will often require more frequent dosing. Infants and toddlers have a larger functioning liver mass per kilogram of body weight, which means their cytochrome P450 is on point. School-age children and adolescents These older children are still a little hypermetabolic, but the dose-effect relationship is more linear and transparent as they get older. Their physiologic clearance is improved, and from a physical standpoint, these are typically lower-risk children. From a psychological standpoint, though, this group may need just a little more consideration, and non-pharmacologic support is important to modulate pain optimally. Non-pharmacologic treatment. All right, let's do something about the pain. Remember this, the first line treatment in all pain management is non-pharmacopoeia. What do I mean by this? Anything that you can do to support, to distract, to entertain, to minimize the pain. Basically, it's your secret sauce that you use to pour all over your analgesic plan. Not only is this the safest of all techniques, but non-pharmacologic techniques can also be the most effective. Some are simple comfort measures, like splinting a fracture or a sprain, or applying cold to the acute soft tissue injury, or heat to the non-traumatic, non-specific pain. Many a pain control regimen has been sabotaged without consideration of non-pharmacologic techniques. Think of non-pharmacopoeia as your base coat or primer before applying additional coats of analgesic treatment. With the right base coat foundation, you have a better chance of painting a patient's symptoms a bit more tolerable and a longer lasting new color. Let's use a tailored approach based on age that will allow us to employ a child's developmental strengths and avoid the frustration that results in asking the child to do what he's just not capable of doing yet. So here we go, rapid fire, non-pharmacologic tricks by age. Neonate and infant, zero to 12 months. Involve the parent and have the parent visible to the child at all times, if at all possible. Make advances slowly in a non-threatening manner. Limit the number of staff in the room. Use soothing sensory measures. Speak softly, offer a pacifier, and stroke the skin softly. Swaddle the infant and encourage the parent to comfort him during and after the procedure. Engage their developing sensory motor skills to distract them. Toddler to preschooler, one to five years. Use the same techniques as for the infant and add descriptions of what he'll hear, what he'll see, what he'll feel. 
You can use a toy or a doll to demonstrate the procedure, but use simple, direct language. Give calm, firm directions. Give them one at a time. Explain what you're going to do just before doing it. Don't allow too much time for fear or anxiety to root. Offer choices when appropriate and ignore temper tantrums. Distraction techniques can be storytelling, can be bright and flashy toys. You can blow bubbles, blow pinwheels, or have another staff member play peekaboo across the room. Everyone has a smartphone these days. Use it to your advantage. Videos or games can be mesmerizing at this age. school age children, 6 to 12 years. Explain procedures using simple language and just briefly the reason. Remember, this group has a very vague idea of what bodily functions are. Allow the child to ask questions and involve him when you think it's appropriate. You can use distraction techniques like games or videos, but also talk them through a story with guided imagery. Tell them what they're seeing, what they're feeling, what they're doing. They want to run with the fantasy. If the child is particularly interested, you can give him a minor job to do in a minor procedure. Like, raise your hand every time I finish a stitch to make sure the nurse knows I did it. The adolescent, 13 and up. You can use the same techniques for the school-aged child, but add to it. Encourage questioning. Impose as few restrictions as possible. Be flexible with these guys. Now, this group can regress too. Expect more childish coping mechanisms the more stress they get. Distraction techniques with adolescents can be anything that's their jam. Video games, guided imagery, muscle relaxation meditation, and most importantly, music. Make sure it's their music whenever possible. Applied Pharmacology. All right, we've identified the pain, we understand where it comes from and how to target therapy, and we've applied our base coat of non-pharmacologic techniques. Now let's talk common scenarios and the typical management for each. Head and neck pain. Most common non-traumatic head and neck complaints can be managed non-pharmacologically. For example, for a simple mild headache, you need improved hydration, better sleep, improved stress control, and better nutrition. All are mainstays, but all of them take time. Take this opportunity to manage expectations. You can augment this plan with PO medications like NSAIDs. The anti-inflammatory nature of ibuprofen, for example, will treat the cause as well as the symptoms of ear pain, of sore throat, or other muscular pains. 10 milligrams per kilogram by mouth every four to six hours as needed up to the adult dose. According to Bailey et al. in a Cochrane review, ibuprofen may be more effective than acetaminophen or paracetamol for odontogenic pain. For most applications, acetaminophen is probably just fine. Combining acetaminophen and ibuprofen is not likely to be more effective than either agent individually, according to Mary et al. in the Canadian Journal of Anesthesia. True migraine headache may be treated with all of the above, and rescue therapy may include prochlorperamide at 0.15 mg per kilogram IV up to 10 mg. You can also give diphenhydramine at 1 mg per kilogram PO or IV, up to 50 milligrams, and it's helpful to give some IV fluids. If needed, you can also use Ketorolac at 0.5 milligrams per kilogram IV, up to the new limit of 10 milligrams. Thanks, Sidgi. Remember that in general, PO and IV forms of NSAIDs are clinically equivalent in efficacy. <music> Chest pain. After ruling out important pulmonary etiologies like the under-recognized spontaneous pneumothorax or 
cardiac problems like pericarditis or myocarditis, many chest complaints are amenable to NSAIDs. There's often a large component of anxiety in the child or in the parents in chest pain. Remember, no amount of medication will assuage them without addressing their concerns as well. Non-pharmacopoeia for the win. Abdominal pain. Abdominal pain in children is challenging because it's common, it's often benign, but it can be disastrous if we miss a surgical emergency. For mild pain, consider acetaminophen or paracetamol at 15 milligrams per kilogram per dose every four to six hours as needed up to 650 milligrams. The oral route is preferred, but intravenous acetaminophen is an option for parents unable to tolerate PO or for those that you just can't give PR per rectum because of things like neutropenia. For children with moderate to severe abdominal pain where you want to keep them in PO, consider IV hydration and volume repletion and offer frequent small aliquots of a narcotic agent. Now, we all know this, but just to remind us, surgical pain is not erased by opioids. Mantarola et al. in another Cochrane review in 2007 actually found that treating pain improves specificity to certain surgical emergencies with retained diagnostic accuracy. If there's some interdepartmental concern about prolonged effects of an analgesic, of sedation, or of limitation in the physical exam, or if there's just a need to see if the pain will come back, you can opt to use fentanyl initially because it has a shorter half-life. More frequent reassessments may help the surgical team to deliberate. Transition quickly to a longer-acting opioid as soon as you can. Long bone injuries. We should jump all over fracture pain with immediate splinting and analgesia. We can use various routes. Oral, intranasal, and intravenous routes are all acceptable depending on the severity of the injury and the symptoms. Intranasal medications offer the advantage of fast onset for moderate to severe pain, either as monotherapy or as a bridge to parenteral treatment. You'll recall that the ideal volume for intranasal medication is 0.25 ml per naris, with a maximum of 1 ml per naris. Common concentrations of fentanyl limit its milligram per kilogram use in the school-aged child, but it turns out you can use intranasal ketamine for sub-dissociative dose pain control. Long bone injuries are a good opportunity to use a quick, effective modality that doesn't take much setup. Nebulized fentanyl. According to Miner et al., clinically significant improvement in pain scores are achieved with the 3 microgram per kilogram per dose of fentanyl administered from the standard nebulizer. You can use this in children 3 years of age and older. Deaton et al. found nebulized fentanyl to be a rapid, non-invasive, nice alternative to the intranasal route for older children, for adolescents or adults, in whom the volume of intranasal medication would exceed the recommended per naris volume. For long bone fractures, consider an aggressive, multimodal approach to control symptoms up front. For example, for a simple forearm fracture, you may opt to give an oral opioid, perform a hematoma block, and offer inhaled nitrous oxide for reduction. Lumen et al. found this method equally efficacious compared with formal intravenous procedural sedation. Think also about ultrasound-guided peripheral nerve blocks. After initial treatment and in communication with referring consultants, they can come in handy. Before we leave the subject of fractures, a special note on codeine. Tylenol with codeine, or some people call it T3, has never been a very effective pain medication. Up to 10% of patients lack the enzyme needed to metabolize it into morphine, which is its active form. New evidence is now building that there is an erratic and unpredictable individual metabolism of codeine. 
Some children are ultra-rapid metabolizers of codeine to morphine, causing a rapid bolus of the available drug with respiratory depression and, unfortunately, death in some cases. My advice, take codeine off your formulary. Skin and soft tissue. Skin and soft tissue injuries or abscesses or cellulitides, they often require solid non-pharmacopoeia in addition to local anesthetics. For IV cannulation, for example, consider EMLA if the patient's stable and a minor delay is okay. Topical ethyl chloride vapor coolant offers transient pain relief because of rapid cooling just before the IV start. Try this. Engage your young child's imagination to distract him and say, have you ever held a snowball? You're in luck. It's just like that. Shh, here, do you feel it? You can use also vibratory adjuncts like the Buzzy Bee. It's placed near the IV cannulation site and buzzes along to provide mechanical and cognitive distraction. Have you ever tried needleless lidocaine injectors? They can facilitate IV placement without obscuring the target vein. The medication is propelled into the dermis by a CO2 cartridge that makes a loud popping sound. So try this to alleviate the anxiety. Just before using it, your skin looks very thirsty. I think it needs a drink. There you are. As with any minor procedure, when you tell a child what you're going to do, be sure to do it right away. Don't delay or build suspense. Lidocaine epinephrine tetracaine gel is used for open or mucosal wounds. Apply as soon as possible in the visit. The goal of LET is to pre-treat the wound to allow for a painless administration of an injectable anesthetic. Now, some people will do this. It's now at the anecdotal level of evidence, but some people will apply LET two or three times at 15-minute intervals for a deeper anesthesia in an attempt to avoid injection altogether. There's ongoing research now to offer a more evidential base to this anecdotal practice. A special note on the burned child. This is another opportunity to make a difference and assess and treat rapidly. You can submerge the affected extremity in room temperature water, or you can apply room temperature saline soaked gauze. This will slow down ongoing thermal damage. It'll soothe the wound and will provide some foundational first aid. Minor burns you can treat topically and with oral medications. Major burns, you're going to need intranasal medications, maybe intramuscular or IV analgesics like morphine. You can always escalate to ketamine. You can give it actually even as an intramuscular dose at the procedural sedation level, especially for children who it would be extremely painful to hold them down just to get the IV. Remember, post-traumatic disorders are common in burns. Get the child's pain controlled as soon as you can. All right, that will get you through most trouble that you'll encounter. Stop here if your brain is full or if you need to come back. But I know you. You want just a little more. Pause here if you need to, but keep listening and we'll talk about helping the child with special needs and pain. A few specific scenarios. Specific scenarios. First, let's talk about how to help the child with chronic medical problems. Children with acute exacerbations of their chronic pain or episodic painful crises will require special attention. Some examples are recurring pain from those suffering from sickle cell disease, from juvenile idiopathic arthritis, complex regional pain syndrome, or cancer. Find out whether these symptoms and circumstances are typical for them and what regimen has helped in the past. Previous unpleasant experiences may prime these children with amplified anxiety and perception of pain. So target the disease process 
and do your best to show the patient and the family that you understand his condition and his needs. An equally challenging scenario we see is the child with chronic pain. Treat the entire patient with a multimodal approach. Limit opioids as you can. As an opioid sparing strategy or as rescue therapy, think about subdissociative ketamine, especially for conditions like sickle cell crisis, complex regional pain syndrome, autoimmune disorders, or chronic pain due to subacute trauma. Intranasal ketamine can be used for subdissociative pain control at 0.5 to 1 milligram per kilogram. Intravenous infusions of ketamine at 0.1 to 0.3 milligrams per kilogram per hour can be initiated in the ED and continued for 4 to 8 hours per day up to a maximum of 16 hours total in 3 consecutive days, according to a study by Sheehy et al. In vaso-occlusive episodes, dexmedetomidine has been shown to be an effective adjunct for severe pain poorly responsive to opioids or ketamine. The Child with Cognitive Impairment Children with cognitive impairment, like those with various genetic or metabolic syndromes or primary neurologic conditions like some of those with cerebral palsy, are a challenge to assess and treat properly. These children not only can't explain their symptoms, but they also have atypical expressions of pain. Pain responses in severely intellectually disabled children include a full-blown smile, which may or may not accompany inappropriate laughter. They may stiffen, or they may just not cooperate. Other observed behaviors include the freezing phenomenon, in which the child acutely feels pain and then he abruptly pauses without moving his face for several seconds. Look also for episodes of unexplained pallor, of diaphoresis, of breath holding, or these shrill vocalizations. The flack has been revised for children with cognitive impairment and appears to be reliable for acute care. The most distressing and perplexing presentation is the parent who brings in his child with cognitive impairment for just general fussiness or irritability or I think he's in pain. Often this happens after significant investigations have been performed and sometimes these investigations are repeated over and over again in-house. Keep in mind that poorly controlled spasticity is often underappreciated as a cause of unexplained pain. Now we treat this not with opioids but with GABA receptor agonists like baclofen or benzodiazepines. Now remember to take special precautions when you give opioids or benzodiazepines in children with metabolic disorders. So a lot of these children with mitochondrial disease or various syndromes, even Down syndrome, trisomy 21, they may have a disproportionate reaction to the medication. Start low and go slow. You have to reassess these children frequently and you titrate in small aliquots. After a careful, meticulous investigation in the ED to rule out occult infection, trauma, electrolyte imbalance, or any surgical causes, the child with cognitive impairment who continues to be symptomatic despite ED treatment may have to be admitted for observation. But in some cases, especially if you suspect that his spasticity is poorly controlled, you may elect to add gabapentin to the typical regimen. This has been shown to manage unexplained irritability in these children, according to Howard et al. in 2007. It treats their visceral hyperalgesia. Multi-trauma. The child with multi-trauma is in need of meticulous critical care. Make frequent assessments of their pain and their response to the medication. We're typically talking IV here. Here is where we earn our keep. Unexpected tachycardia may be the child's pain or an early sign of shock. If we don't control the child's pain, it's very difficult to distinguish the extreme tachycardia from pain or from blood loss. 
If the child is obviously distressed by the pain and his mental status is normal, then treat the pain. If unclear, then treat it as shock. If he's intubated, control the pain first with a fentanyl drip, and then you can use a sedative in addition if you need to to keep him comfortable. Remember, we can't sedate people out of pain. Treat the pain first. The Child Under Palliative Care Children undergoing palliative care need a multidisciplinary approach from us. This includes engaging the patient's care team as well as considering the effect on members of the patient's family. Children may be undergoing palliation from the natural course of their disease. They may have devastating chromosomal abnormalities or neurologic conditions or other congenital problems. They may have terminal cancer. Family dynamics and family members' needs are often overlooked, and we need to think about the family as a whole. Focus on the productive and beneficial treatments that we can offer. Treat pain promptly, but speak with the parents about end-of-life goals as early as possible because any analgesic or sedative that you give can have an untoward effect. You don't want to be caught in the position of having to code a child undergoing palliative care because of the lack of understanding of how increasingly large doses of pain medication can affect breathing and circulation. Children with ongoing opioid requirements may present not so much with an exacerbation of their chronic pain, but a complication of its treatment. Identify, assess, and aggressively treat constipation, nausea or vomiting, pruritus or urinary retention. Treating the side effects of pain management may be just as important for quality of life as treating the pain itself. Now, that's a lot to consider. Here are a few rapid-fire pearls to keep in mind as you try to implement what we've just talked about. 1. Allow the child to speak for himself whenever possible. After acknowledging the parent's input, perhaps try, I want to make sure I understand how the pain is for you. Tell me more. 2. Engage parents and communicate the plan to them. Elicit their expectations and give them a preview of what to expect in the ED. 3. Opioids are meant for pain caused by acute tissue injury for the briefest period of time feasible. Older school-age children and adolescents are increasingly at risk for opioid dependence and addiction. 4. Premature infants present a challenge in pain control. Their pain is under-recognized, and they often display atypical responses to painful stimuli. Treatment is equally difficult as they're particularly sensitive to analgesia or sedation. This is important as this group is even more likely to undergo painful procedures because of their high-risk status. 5. Give detailed advice on how to manage pain at home. Set expectations. Let them know you understand and that you're going to help them through with your good advice that will keep them as safe as possible through this difficult time. Patients and families often just need a plan. Map it out clearly. Okay, here comes the grand summary. In pediatric acute pain, remember the three guiding principles. Know the child, know the family, and know the physiology. Use your observational skills and enhance them with collateral information. Each age range has its own expression of pain and its own physiology. Tailor your regimen to your young patient's physiologic pitfalls and needs. Treat pediatric pain well and often. 
If we don't address the child's pain, it may have long-lasting consequences. And lastly, non-pharmacologic treatments for all and pharmacologic treatments for many. A multimodal approach is the most effective. As a final note, we can do better. With a little knowledge and attention, we can treat children's pain and avoid downstream consequences. You can change your ways, changing those surrounding you. There's a Senegalese phrase that comes to mind here. Suma yergon, su nu yergon. If we had known, if we had only known. Now go out there and do some good. Thank you for listening to The Playbook. We welcome your comments, questions, and feedback. Email Tim at coach at PEMplaybook.org or drop by our website for show notes and more strategy at PEMplaybook.org. See you there.